Paul. So this is our last talk of the year. Uh, most of you also know that for next year, uh, we have a couple things in the pipeline. We have the future UX panel happening, um, the uh, Philip Hunter, who does the UX of sound for Amazon Alexa. On October 27th, we also have design incubation coming, so there'll be multiple talks. That's open. We're uh, currently accepting abstracts from anyone in academia and industry, and also graduate students are welcome to submit. So if you are interested or you know someone, please submit a talk. If you just Google uh, Deval and design incubation, that will come up uh, on easily, easy to find. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about Adam. Um, Adam and I met about two years ago in a graduate school uh, program that we were doing together. His story at the time um, was very empowering and emotional. And at that time, um, his, sort of his tra trajectory of his work was, was greatly changing. It was pretty inspiring to watch him go through that. I just saw him present his thesis work uh, just about a month ago. Um, we also did, a, for some of you, we did a workshop together last night. There were about 10 of us. Um, that, that did our own work and projected that throughout the city together. So that was also pretty empowering. We had both design students. We also had members of the community who were able to find it. And, and he very nicely, uh, for some who were not designers, he helped them make their own designs that we were able to project together. So that was pretty amazing, uh, incredibly moving. So um, I hope that you'll enjoy hearing Adam's story. You'll connect with him after. Um, he has the prints uh, that you're also welcome to have him sign. And that you'll also feel empowered uh, to do your own work. So um, his story is incredibly moving. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome Adam. Thank you. So uh, first thing I want to do is I want to thank you guys for having me. Um, very humbled to be here. Um, I had the chance over the last couple of days to spend time um, with DePaul students and meet faculty. And this, you guys have a really amazing thing going on here. Um, it seems like a really special place. And I feel uh, humbled and honored to have the time um, to be with you. And, um, and Heather, who is like a sister to me, I uh, thank you so much for bringing me. This is really great. So. What I'm going to do um, before I start talking about, um, if you saw the title of the talk, it's kind of uh, design activism, these ideas about graphic witness and all of these things. So before I talk about those things, I just want to give you guys a little bit of an idea uh, about my background. And what I'm not going to do is be one of these artists that come and just talk about their work incessantly, because I think it's, it's, it's not helpful for you guys. You don't really get much out of that. Um, but I, I want to share a couple of pieces to show kind of where I came from. Um, to give you context um, for where I'm at now, right? So um, I went to art school when I was 19. I had no business being in school at that time. Um, I was a fine art major in a BFA program. Um, and I was a sculptor. I, I specialized in sculpture and printmaking, and I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, so I dropped out, and I started working in a sculpture foundry when I was 20. Um, it was one of those jobs that I felt completely ass backwards into. Um, so I was working with these like massively huge artists um, at 20, and it was just kind of, it was a crazy experience. But I got to see kind of the dirty part of the art business like right from the beginning. If you guys know anything about sculpture, if you have any experience working um, in the sculpture industry, it's big, big business. It's um, it's like high corporate design business. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, a million dollar piece, you know, millions of dollar pieces. Um, and it's just, uh, it's um, not what you think it's going to be. So anyways, at, at 20, I was doing pieces like this. So this is the last major piece that Frederick Hart did, um, major uh, figure of sculptor of the 20th century. Um, this is called The Daughters of Odessa. And what I did, um, I, had a, I ended up having a knack for patina work. So that's the coloring of bronzes or metals. So it's basically like painting with a blowtorch. So it's like super fucking rad um, to do and also crazy dangerous. Um, especially when you're hungover, which I was a lot because I was 20 years old and I was working in the studio. Um, so this piece here is actually um, a patina I did on his sculpture, and this was, this is at Buckingham Palace. So like I, I like to think about like Prince Charles looking at this, um, and uh, the fact that I was like totally like bombed on bong hits like before I got to like <laughs> that day that I did this piece. And that makes me feel really good about that that time. Um, so again, like patina work, so this is a Richard Dreyfus piece, or not Richard Dreyfus, John, yeah, Richard Dreyfus, uh, a John Dreyfus piece. Um, so I did like, specialized in like old, like historic patina, so this has like this old Tiffany type patina on it, um, a Clement Meadmore piece. Um, and then through this time, 
I got to work with this, oh, not the, oh actually, I'm not there yet. So the, oh, this is actually my favorite thing that I ever did. So I'm a huge Detroit Tigers fan. Um, and we got, I got to work with the sculptor. Um, actually, you guys know the sculptor. So if you guys have been to the uh, Bulls Arena in Chicago, the Jordan sculpture that's outside of that, this is the same artist. This is Amri Amrani, he's an uh, Israeli artist. Um, and I got a chance to work with him on these sculptures. So it was really amazing. So f every year we go to Detroit a couple of times to see games and I take like a million pictures of these sculptures. And my wife is like, all right, I fucking get it. Like you made that, like, all right, no more pictures of this. Like, so anyways, but anyways, I had to share that because it's my favorite thing. So during this time, what kind of got me out of this realm of working um, was this guy. Does anybody know who this is? Yell it out if you know who this is. Yeah, total fuck face. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that you guys are recording this, uh, but I, I, don't, I don't care. Um, so anyway, so if, if you know anything about Jeff Koons, he's a conceptual artist. So basically what he does is he comes to a foundry or a studio with a very loose idea of what he wants to do. And when I say loose, I'm talking about like drawn on loose leaf paper, like that loose. Um, and then you have people that kill themselves to make these pieces. Um, like this one here that would sell for $15 million. And you have people that are actually making the work and making like $8 an hour. So when you see this work in these museums like the Chicago Institute, and you're like, this artist is amazing. How is it possible? It's not possible. They have no ability to make any of this work. And when pieces like this are made, you have people like me sleeping in the studio around the clock um, to be able to meet the deadline, to get it off to Paris or wherever, wherever it goes. And then they put their name on it and sell it for $30 million. So that's the dirty end of the art business. Um, and that happens every day. I mean, he has an entire studio full of painters that are just making his work and slaving. And if they, you know, he, they rub him the wrong way, he'll get rid of them. And there's 30 more people waiting for that spot. Um, so it was something I didn't want to do. Um, so I stopped making for about 10 years after this. Um, and I started working in social work. Um, crisis intervention, working in my local hospital, um, and I was doing art therapy stuff um, with some of my kids, and they were just like, man, you can really draw. Like, why aren't you doing something with this? And I was like, maybe, maybe they're right. Maybe it's time to start doing something again. So what I did is I went back to art school and finished my degree in graphic design. Um, and during that time, um, I was really drawn to the hand aspect of graphic design. And really when I went into it, graphic design was kind of an idea that it's a way that I could make money um, and be able to still make and then do the things I want on the side. And then when I got into a design program, it ended up that's where I probably was meant to be all along, right? Um, so hand uh, design is where I was kind of drawn to. So screen printing, letterpress printing, um, and any way that I could get take kind of processes outside of the computer, um, I, I wanted to do that. So I collaborated a lot too. So this was done uh, with, a, with a group, uh, a studio called Leg Graffiti there in Delaware. Super progressive letterpress shop um, before letterpress was hip. Like right now you see letterpress everywhere. These guys were doing it before that. Um, they do really amazing things. Like this project here that we work on now, it's ended this year, but it's called the Tour de Leg Graffiti. So what we do is it's an endurance printing um, project. So we follow the Tour de France. So every, and I, and I didn't, give a shit about biking before I did this project. Now I can't get enough of it because Ray, this crusty old guy right here that's in here with me, um, he got me into it and it's his, it's his shop. So basically we get up in the morning, we watch the Tour de France, we go to lunch and we talk about what we saw. We go back to the studio, get really super drunk and then we print a poster um, the entire day into, into the night. So we, you, know, you start at six in the morning, you end at like two in the morning and then by the time the day's over, you have one poster and then you get up the next day and you do the whole thing again until the Tour de France is done, even on the rest days. Um, so he's gotten a lot of really cool recognition for this project, like Sports Illustrated covered it, the British Museum bought, um, the British Library bought uh, a series of them, so it's really gotten some cool press, and it's a really interesting. So long story short, the collaborative aspect of design is something I'm really interested in. Um, also, this is another one of the tour posters. So I was doing this, I'm also doing, I'm not gonna show you any of this work, but I was also doing like traditional digital design. So I had my own studio. Um, right out of school, I started my own studio. Again, something I wouldn't recommend you guys doing. It was a disaster. Like right from the, we had no. And during this time, I was actually on the AIGA board and I was preparing to bring him to Pennsylvania and working all these things. This is in 2014. And this is where my career took like a massive uh, turn and where my work will always be now since then. So during 2014, I was actually in the studio working on this print. My brother came to live with us. Um, him and his wife were having some problems. 
Um, so, I mean, our family is very, very close knit. So if one of us is down and out, um, you come and stay with me for as long as you want. Like you have, we'll take care of it. Like that's what we do. We share meals together. We vacation together. We are best friends in every single way. So he came to live with us. Um, and he was with us for, I don't know, maybe three or four months. Um, and then on September 19th of 2014, um, I knew he was struggling. He was having a hard time. He kind of made the decision that him and his wife probably weren't going to get back together again. And that was really tough. He had a three-year-old daughter. So he was very, very guilty about, uh, about that. And he was also very, very guilty about staying with me. I mean, I'm his older brother, um, but he was, he was somebody who really had it all together. He was college educated. He was a social worker. Um, the epitome of fitness looked like Mr. Universe. He was, you know, his appearance and all of this was just like paramount to him. So he was very embarrassed to stay with us. So on the morning of September 19th, 2014, I woke up in the morning and he, uh, he wasn't up yet, which is not unusual. Like he was out the night before with his buddies or whatever. Um, and so I went about my day, checking my emails, doing my stuff. Um, and now it's about 10 o'clock and he's still not awake. I'm like, it's still not totally unusual. And I never checked on him when he stayed with us because I didn't want to embarrass him. I wanted to give him his space. I wanted him to feel like my home was his home and he wasn't imposing on me in any way. Um, so it got a little bit later and then I knocked on the door at a certain point, he didn't answer. And I opened the door and his bed was, he wasn't in his bed. And I was like, oh great, he just didn't come home last night. Um, it's perfect, you know, it, it happened a lot. Like, I, I didn't have to worry. Um, and I went to turn and he was on the floor um, in his room. And I knelt down and grabbed his hand and he was, he was dead. He was gone. I had no idea what was happening. I was screaming. Um, I had to call 911. I had to have paramedics like rush into my house. Uh, before that, they had, to, like, they, asked, they had to talk me through trying to give him CPR, which I did, but I knew he was dead. I, I mean, I, I, I knew that he was already gone. Um, so I went through this process, the police come, they eventually usher me downstairs in my home. Um, and after a certain amount of time, an officer came down and started to kind of interrogate me in my living room. You know, just tell us what happened. We know, we already know what happened. You need to come clean and tell us what happened. And I'm like, I don't, I can't even process the question at this point, right? Like, I mean, this is my best friend who's dead upstairs. Um, that's one thing too, that uh, of this time, or a moment like that that was really, I think about it often, I probably should make work around this, but I haven't yet, is that I found my brother dead and I was the only person um, in the world that really cared about him that knew he was gone. And I had to live with that pressure for a small amount of time before I started the terrible chain reaction of having to tell people um, that he was gone. So anyways, um, so this officer's interrogating me um, on the spot and I have no idea what the fuck he's talking about. I can't answer. He's, and, and then he's like, after I'm not answering his questions, he's like, well, you know he was a heroin addict. And all of a sudden I'm like, how is that even a possibility? I had no, and I had worked as a crisis counselor in my local hospital also during, for 15 years during this time. Um, it was only recently that I stopped doing that work on top of all of the teaching and all the other things that I was doing. I was still moonlighting as a crisis counselor and I worked with people struggling with heroin addiction and I saw none of that in my brother. Um, so, so, so I find out that he supposedly he was, was a heroin addict or whatever that means. Um, and that he died of this, um, which I still don't believe in some ways. And then I had to go to my parents' house after being interrogated by the police, finding my, my best friend dead, tell my mother that my brother was gone. I had to watch my mother tell my father that my brother was gone. I had to call my wife. Uh, my brother's daughter was there, and she was only three, and I had to watch her watch us tell people that he was gone. It was, it, it changed my life um, in, in an instant. I mean, it's amazing when you become, when you are so close to someone like your brother from the time that you were a small child to the time you were an adult, there's a part of you that never um, grows up. You're always a kid. Um, and then as soon as I found him gone, I was instantly shot into being an adult. Um, and it was, I'm still trying to figure that out. So uh, I'm at my parents' house, and a couple of hours later, the detective who's now in charge of my brother's case calls my parents' house. And he, again, is like, just tell me what happened. We know you know what happened. I'm like, dude, at this point, now I'm starting to get angry. I'm like, go fuck yourself. I have no idea what you're talking about. Don't question my integrity. I can't, you know. Uh, and I'm also saying things like, all right, we need to go fucking find out where this heroin came from. We need to kick doors in. We need to do something about this. And this officer, this fucking guy, says to me, 
Uh, you need to lower your expectations. I've seen hundreds of these, and there's nothing remarkable about your brother's death. This is the first day. So how far do you think any drug investigation goes into if someone dies? I can tell you where it goes. It goes nowhere because I experienced it. Now imagine if you're the Hispanic family that lives in that city that cannot speak English, and you have this white officer trying to get information from them. How far do you think that goes? Probably the doorstep before they decide they're not going to do anything about it. So I'm trying to grapple with all of these things happening, the loss of my brother. Um, and during that time, what I started to do in the months that followed is I started to make artwork about it. And I started to do it as a way to deal with my grief. It ha I had no intention of getting to the point where I'm sitting at DePaul University and talking to students about my work. That was not my intent. My intention was I'm an artist, I'm a graphic designer, I'm a printmaker, I have a compulsion to make, so in times when I'm fucked up, I'm gonna make artwork, and it's gonna not necessarily help me, but it's gonna be something I'm gonna be able to do to be able to kind of clarify how I feel about things. Um, so I started to make work like this guy right here. Um, so what I was doing is I was making work not only about my specific story, which I'll show you, but also all of the things now that I started to learn. Um, so what I did it was one of the ways that I coped, and it probably wasn't healthy, but it gave me a huge understanding of what was happening as I read absolutely everything I could possibly find. I talked to every person I could possibly talk to about how we got to this place we were going in our country um, and understanding addiction from different levels, and I'm still evolving this. If you were to talk to me three years ago, I'd sound much differently than I sound now because I'm constantly trying to educate myself to be as helpful as I can. So anyways, so I was making this work Poster after poster after poster. I designed maybe 50 posters. I printed probably 4,000 screen prints by hand. So I was in my studio just as a, as a therapeutic compulsion, just pulling and pulling and pulling prints. My story now is starting to pile up all around me in my home, in my studio, um, to the point where it was almost like my, my studio space was just piles of posters everywhere. And this was going on for probably about a year, six, six months or a year that I was making this work. Um, and then I was like, I have to purge this work. I can't deal with it. Because I, I don't know if you guys experience the same thing, but as a maker, um, I feel really great when I'm making something. And then as soon as I'm done, I feel really depressed. It's something that I deal with. Um, and this was, I, making it in the process of making it and letting that flow, that creative flow happen, um, was, it was, it worked for me, but then as soon as the work was done, it started to pile up. I had to deal with the things I was talking about, and I wasn't prepared to do that. At least I didn't think I was. So what I decided, and this now was, we were coming up on this, it was about two years I was making this work. We were coming up on the second anniversary of my brother's death, um, which was September 19th, and I decided that I was gonna take a 1,000 of these posters, and I live in a small city, a 20,000 person city, so it's tiny. Um, and I was gonna put a thousand pieces of artwork out overnight in one night. So I got a couple of friends of mine and we went and hung all of these prints on every light standard, every telephone pole, every light standard we could with no expectation. It was a way for me to purge the work, it was a way for me to honor my brother, um, and it was a way for me to like, let some of this work go with no expectation. I fully thought that they were gonna just hang on the poles and rot off. And what happened, um, is this, this is one of the shots from the night or the day. So we had these all over the place, all over the city. And within a couple of days, a buzz started to happen, happen around these posters. And people were asking where they came from. Like some of the things that I was talking about too. And I was anonymous at this point. I wasn't coming forward and letting people know that I did this because that wasn't my intention either um, to get any type of credit for this. It wasn't about that. It was, it was about making work solely for, for a therapeutic process for myself at this point. Um, so people started to talk about this, um, and people were, a lot of the things I talked about were specific ways that the system handled my family. Um, and people started to ask questions on social media. And two days, or a day later, the police started hassling local artists in our area who they thought did the work. Um, so I came forward and told them that I did it because I didn't want those artists to be hassled. Um, so I came forward, um, and they, so they knew who did the work, and then two days after that, the mayor ordered our police department to destroy all the work in the city. So they sent out, the, the mayor or the chief of police, I'm not sure who, it doesn't really matter, they're, they're super connected. Um, but so the police department went out for three or four hours and destroyed all of this artwork, citing an ordinance that you can't hang work on light standards 
um, or telephone poles in the city. But the problem is, and they were planning to charge me at this point, but the problem is what they did is they tore down my work around every other local DJ or yard sale. Um, so it had nothing to do with, um, it had absolutely nothing to do with a law and everything to do with the fact that I was touching on a subject they did not want the public to be talking about. Um, so um, so they, they couldn't charge me because it was discrimination. So they, they, they put me in a position where like, I would have had recourse if they would have done that. So they, they backed off. But at this point now, I'm like, no, wait a minute. Like, I'm touching on something, and, and they're doing all they can to try to let this message not get out. So I'm just like, no, wait a minute. Now, maybe, maybe I need to use this for something more. So, it, uh, so what I did is I printed more posters. Right, let me show you some of these guys first. I'll stop rambling on. So this is one of the. This is probably the poster that got things torn down. So I also was using the actual people from my community as the characters in my posters. So um, this one is the coroner in our city, and uh, the detective was, it was in charge of my brother's case. So it says, "Here's another harem-related death certificate to add to the pile. File it under low priority." And the officer is saying, "I'll feed the family a line and shut it down. This one's cut and dry." So this is very. Um, this seems like it might be some type of like. Um, uh, I can't think of the word, um, some type of like idea of what might be happening, um, but this is actually what is happening. I mean, this is, I mean, they didn't say these exact words to us, but this is what was said to us. I also worked in a local emergency room, so I was privy to those conversations when they were happening around me with other people. Um, so they're not interested in trying to figure out where these drugs are coming from or stopping them. And I fully believe that this crisis that we're in right now is not one that we can arrest our way out of. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And that doesn't mean arresting people also that are using drugs. The fact in our country that we arrest people for using drugs is fucking ridiculous. I mean, we need to take the lead of places like Portugal that have decided to decriminalize drug use but drug sale will still be, will still be handled. Our, I mean, there's a reason why you know, the United States is only 5% of the world's population, but we have 25% of the world's prison population. It's because they lock people up for petty drug crimes, which are absolutely ridiculous. So oh, that's the other thing you're gonna notice through this talk. I mean, the only reason I do this, I'm doing this work now, is so that I can bring you guys in with this like semi-good design work and I can hold you hostage and you're gonna to listen to me talk about the issue. Because that is the difference between artists that do this work from a legitimate standpoint and those that are just trying to whore their work around. Because there are plenty of people doing work in the social justice realm, especially now with design for good being this thing, whatever the fuck that means, um, that will do this work because it's already perceived important before they make it. And then what they do is they just, they just kind of like pass their work from place to place to place. And when you see them speak about their work or it's presented, it's all about the work they did and this beautiful design work. I don't give a shit about this. What I care about is being able to put this up and hold you guys in a spot that I can talk to you about this. And hopefully by the time that we're done, you have a question to ask about this and you seek that out. If you've done that, then I've done my job um, as a designer and an artist. Sorry, if I get on soapboxes too, it's because I'm super passionate about this. Um, plus, I don't get to ask to talk a lot, so I'm really pent up, so I'm gonna take it out on you guys tonight. Um, so some of the work I was doing also, um, I was reflecting, this, this is a therapeutic work, reflecting, I, I had to make the 911 call. Um, so I was trying to replay that um, in my head, and I started to write it out, and I was carving big, giant woodblock prints and just carving the words out. Um, and I started to put this stuff out on the street also. The poster that I gave you guys tonight um, has this on there, and I'm sharing it because these are the things that aren't shared about this epidemic. The personal moments, the massive tragedy, the destruction that happens after, um, that families hide because of stigma. They're afraid to share these things um, because of how they're gonna be perceived after. And I can be honest with you, in the beginning, I kind of felt that way, you know? Um, but now, I, have, I, I think we need to share it all and get past this idea that using an addiction, it, it makes you less than. Um, it's just, just not the case. It, it is outright a brain disease. It's proven in every way. I mean, even though we have a president right now in office that believes nothing uh, when it comes to science, um, there's science and there's facts behind things. And the fact is, when you use heroin after the first time, the receptors in your brain change forever. They're not changing back. So the need and the crave to use has nothing to do with getting high and everything to do with now 
serving this physiological need to have to use. So again, this one. So I also, like I said, I mean, I also encourage you guys to borrow and steal the things that are gonna make your work come across the best. I mean, I'm outright stealing the work of Albrecht Durer here to get my point across, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, this isn't plagiarism, this isn't, this isn't trying to build off, I, I will fully tell you the background image is a Durer image, but it said everything I needed to say. Um, and then I drew on top of it. Um, and I also, as designers too, like I'll say, well, just one thing about the work. One thing you guys should really try to do is work in and out of processes. So hand drawing, scanning, bringing it in, spitting it back out, drawing again, marking it up, bringing it back in, and using these things as tools and not crutches. As graphic designers, we often um, go straight to this box um, and your work ends up suffering for it massively. Um, so I encourage you guys to, to do as much as you can in and out and use it as the tool that it is. So this was in the paper, anti-heroin poster spark controversy. Um, so they didn't, like I said, they didn't want to talk about um, the issues that I was putting out there. They wanted to try to hide them at all costs. And the main reason and the saddest part about this whole thing is you ask why. Well, why wouldn't they want to help? Why wouldn't they want to talk about these things? And I'll tell you why. It's capitalism at its worst. They don't want to put money behind this problem. They want to spend it on the local pool. They want to try to segregate neighborhoods. They want to try to keep things separated and keep the money in certain places. Um, because in the surface, when I started doing this work in 2014, um, it wasn't as understood as it is now that this is not a socioeconomic issue. This breathes on all of our doorsteps. It's there. It's going, it's going to affect us. Um, there's this idea of this word addict, and that's one thing that I'm going to charge you guys with um, and ask you to do for me. If you give a shit about anything I'm saying tonight, um, I want you to do this for me. I want you to try to stricken the word addict from your vocabulary from this point forward. Uh, when I say addict, what does that look like? Somebody yell it out. Like, what, is, what does an addict look like? Honestly. Homeless. Homeless. What else? Anything. What do they physically look like? Unshowered. Unshowered. What else? Skinny. Skinny. What's that in the back? Malnutrition. Okay, so we already, like culturally, we have this idea, like burned in our, our mind of what it looks like. And I, I should have a brother, a picture of my brother in here. I just am not brave enough to share his image this way yet. But if you saw his image, he had 20 inch arms. He had a neck this big, chest out to here, to epitome of fitness. That is what this looks like. It looks like um, the local doctor or nurse or any one of you guys in here. I, it could be, I would imagine that someone in this room has struggled with either opioid use or heroin at some point. The, the statistics tell us that is true. So look around at anyone and that is what this looks like. So what I'm gonna ask you guys to do is not use the word addict and use the word, the word substance use disorder. It seems like such a simple thing and this is how you can help right now. If we walk out of here with the idea that this is a substance use disorder and not someone who's an addict or someone that is less than, what we do then is we're coining it as the medical term that it needs to be. And if we start to ingrain that into our language, then it starts to soften those people, the bureaucrats that sit in rooms and make decisions without us, and they will start to put money towards it when they start to look at it as a medical disorder. So I implore you guys to do that. And I'll share a side story on this. I didn't always do that. I sat on a panel discussion in Burlington, Vermont about a year and a half ago, and I was talking, I was, I was just part of the panel, and I was using the word addict over and over and over again. Um, and this guy I met named um, Ed Baker, amazing person. Um, he would struggle with addiction his entire life. He's in his early 70s, now he's a crisis, he's a counselor, um, and he's just amazing wealth of knowledge. And after the talk, he leaned over to me and he said, Adam, I think the work you are doing is amazing. And I'm really in awe of what you do, but you are fucking ignorant. And I was like, tell me more, my friend. And he, and he schooled me um, on, on the same thing I just schooled you on and that changed my life. Because I'm leaving myself open enough to do that. That's the one thing that we have to do with something like this is we have to take the emotion out of it and start to pull in the factual aspects of this that we can build on to make change. When we get emotional and we say things like safe injection sites should not be in my neighborhood because that can't, no, not in my fucking neighborhood. Well, the fact of the matter is it's already in your neighborhood. It's already there. It's already in your house. You just don't know it yet. Um, so we have to 
start to take the emotional aspect of what we think drug use or those that struggle with drug addiction are, and we need to start looking at it as, at a, as a medical disorder, and one that if we change our language, that's a simple thing to do that takes massive steps in the right direction. So another thing that I was doing during this time, which I encourage everyone in here to do that makes work, is you need to write with your work, period. So I forced myself, every piece of artwork that I made, I forced myself and made parameters. So I, I, an 800 word essay I wrote with every single piece of work that I made. It helped me clarify what I was trying to say. It helped me after the fact to be able to live with the work a little better. It helped me to change the things that needed to be changing or needed to be changed. Um, and it ended up just being an amazing log of what I was doing. As designers, we don't often think about writing with our work and it is an imperative um, skill set to have. Um, so I, I implore you guys to do that. It'll make your work so much better. So, so a lot of these pieces talk about the way local coroners handle um, the, um, the epidemic, and they're a really important piece of this puzzle that aren't talked about often. Coroners, when they come on the scene of a drug death, because it's a suspicious death, they make a large decision as to whether or not they're going to be investigated or not. And they make a large decision as to whether or not autopsies are gonna be done. That's really important because when an autopsy is done, um, they find out what is in someone's system beyond, beyond a blood test or a piss test, which just gives like, it says you're on opioids. We need to find out specifically what's in there so we know what to look for on the street. So if they would have done an autopsy with my brother, which they did not, um, they would have found probably that fentanyl was in his system. And if we would have known that fentanyl was in his system, we could have warned other people that fentanyl was on the street. And we might have been able to save other lives. Um, but often coroners are not doing that. Um, for two reasons, if they do that, then the police department also has to investigate these as crimes. And, and a lot of places investigate them as homicides. In my county, they don't. Um, there's one place um, in, in, our, in our city um, now, the coroner is now ruling every drug overdose a murder. Um, so it's a murder. Um, so what's crazy about that in Pennsylvania is if Lebanon and Luzerne County sat right next to each other, if you died in the middle, in one foot it's murder, on one side it's absolutely nothing. That's how fucked up the system is right now, and that's why nothing's getting done. Regardless of what you hear in the media, or you see uh, on television, or you read in the paper, there's very little being done about this besides just talking, and often the talking is very skewed. So a part of this too, I, I'm gonna have these guys kind of like um, interjected into this talk a little bit. I wanted to share with some of you guys my influences. Um, so if anybody doesn't know who this is, this is James Baldwin. Um, you guys, if you don't know who this is, write the name down, burn it in your memory. Um, if activist art or activism or being a quality human being um, or just about any good quality of people, you want to figure out how to do that, you have to read James Baldwin's work. He, he's probably, he's the biggest influence on my work. Um, and he's someone that, um, he's being, he's getting a little bit more attention right now because if you haven't seen the documentary that came out called I Am Not Your Negro, you should definitely check it out. Um, it's, it's a very powerful documentary and then you need to pick up some of his books and start with The Fire Next Time, um, which opens um, with a letter called My Dungeon Shook that he wrote to his nephew on the 100th anniversary of the emancipation. Um, that is, it's, it's amazing. I get teared up just thinking about how powerful it is. Um, so once I, once I started to get all of this kind of, I started to get this buzz about this work, I found out that people were trying to hide it, then it became my passion to make this work, to be able to get things out. Um, and I started to research people like Baldwin to help me figure out what, what does it even mean to be an activist? I don't even, I don't associate with that word any longer just because now it's become, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, if you guys read like People Magazine, it's like this actress is like, she likes bacon sandwiches and taking care of cats and she's a social activist. What the fuck does that mean? Like, what does she do, you know? So I don't really, I don't associate with that word, although probably activism is what I do. Um, I'm, I, I'm also... I'm a graphic designer and an artist first, right? And a community member. So my process, is just so some of the process, so a lot of these drawings, like this one, um, it, they started like late in the night um, after my brother died, me probably drinking way too much and just drawing and drawing out these scenes of these two kind of scumbag cops, like handshaking. Um, and then they turn into uh, pieces like this guy uh, right here. So again, talk about working in and out of process. So I'm starting with a drawing, I'm scanning it in, cleaning it up, I'm spitting it back out, doing more to it, bringing it in, making a six, screen, six color screen print out of this and then letterpress printing on top of that. Um, is that, it's excessive, 
possibly, but a client's not paying for it also, so I can do whatever the fuck I want. And there's something really empowering and great about that also. And that's why, as designers, especially in this era now of like self-publishing and being able to, and the internet, again, you'd be able to get your work out there immediately, you hold an immense amount of power. So as a printmaker, um, I make the drawing late in the night. I clean it up. I make this poster out of it. I, or I pick the paper, I pick the ink, I make this thing, and then I can distribute it myself also. That is power right there. Um, and don't underestimate a poster. If I would have done, the, done this all online, it would have gotten um, forgotten immediately. Because I made these physical artifacts and I put them out um, into my city, they again had a perceived importance because it was a physical artifact. Um, so that is, this idea that print is going away and is dying is total horseshit. Um, that's just uh, a way for you know web companies and digital to try to marginalize print. It's not going away. Um, and it's a super powerful medium that engages people. Um, because now it's like, people are like, what is this paper? They don't even know what the fuck it is, right? So when you do it, it really, um, it has a power. It definitely has a power. So this is the finished piece. And I'm not 100% sure what I'm trying to say here. Like, that, that, that didn't matter also. Like, I, I was telling my stu the students that were in the workshop last night, um, sometimes it's really, really important just to make. And then you can perceive... The, 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 you can perceive the concept after the fact, you, or you can, you can make the concept after the fact. You don't have to have this grandiose idea of changing the world or doing this or doing that. You just need to make, and then you can, you can derive a meaning from that making after the fact. Um, and some of the best work is made that way. We often, like especially art school students, they like are constantly needling and pushing and pulling things. And oh, this doesn't look right. And oh, I don't like this typeface and blah blah. And, the, and all the while, they're not making anything because they're too worried about what it looks like. You need to fucking forget that and just make whatever you can. And then the work is going to be good. It's those people, Krita Kent said this, and I'm going to paraphrase it terribly, but it's those that make work all the time that will eventually uh, make work that matters. That's a terrible paraphrase of what she said, but it's, just, it's, it's the concept that matters. So make and make and make. Uh, so this poster, I don't have the one in here. So what I did, this, I, this is one of the first posters that I made that went out in the street. So the idea was, and I, this isn't one of them, the original, I, I signed them with my fingerprint and ink with the idea that the police would run my print and come looking for the artist um, and spend more time looking for the artist than they did um, taking dealers off the street. And, and really, in essence, they did that. The day that they tore all the work down, they spent four hours on the street tearing that work down that they could have been doing something else. But what they were trying to do is censor and, sh and shield a message. So that message um, to them was more powerful than getting a dealer that's killing people off the street right then and there. So that's, it's super sad, but it also talks to the power that we hold as visual, as visual communicators. Um, yeah. So after the first work went down, um, I had a local business owner that got a hold of me and was like, why don't you cover my entire front of my building in your posters and the police can't tear it down. And I was like, oh, this is gonna be amazing. Um, so I printed a bunch of posters with my students um, and I went and covered the front of this. So I wish I had photographs of this, but I, so I was on this ladder in the middle of the night, like hanging these posters on this huge like tractor trailer bay door. And like all of a sudden, all these police cars like converge on where we're at. Um, somebody called the cops and thought I was like gorilla bombing uh, with posters this spot. And it was a lot of the officers, like the chief of, I didn't know, I only found this out after the fact that the chief of police was there too. He was like off in the shadows somewhere. Um, and uh, they came and they tried to, they're like, what are you doing? And the business owner came out and was like, no, 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 he has permission. And this is what's cool about this spot is it's right next to like the swankiest restaurant in our town. So all these like uh, people were coming out and like really pissed at this. And they, they're the ones that probably called the police. Um, but then they found out that I could be there and I got to watch these cops like deflated, have to like, abandon, like go into the night, totally upset they couldn't arrest me. It was like, mm, it was like the perfect, <laughs> It was like the perfect moment. Um, but this only stayed up for two days before someone tore this down too. And my suspicion is that the police did it or someone. But that was okay, it didn't matter. It was up, it happened, it was photographed. And what's really great is every time they decide to destroy my work, it gets more and more and more important. These stupid little posters get more and more important every time they decide to destroy it. So they play into my hands every time because they're so afraid of these messages getting out there. Um, so that's, again, it just talk, it speaks to the power of what design can do. 
So I don't have it in this in this talk, but I, this is an image of uh, that was in the paper of this guy looking at the posters after they were up. Um, but I found this really, really great image of John Hartfeld. If you guys don't know who that is, um, a political designer from the, the team. He did a lot of um, stuff for a AIZ magazine. It was a communist magazine, but it was really anti-Nazi party. So amazing photo montages. If you guys haven't seen his work, you need to see it. But anyways, I found this really great image of this guy in a derby on the street in like 1924 looking at Hartfeld's posters like similar to this. I should have it in here. That's a huge like, I'm telling you this awesome thing and I can't show you the image. So it's kind of a letdown, but it was really kind of a cool find that this same method is now being used almost 100 years later and it holds the same type of power, which is pretty amazing. So also as a designer, so some of the design choices that I made that probably weren't totally conscious in the beginning, but then I realized why I was doing it is I started to play off of Pennsylvania folk tradition work. So if, you, if you're from Pennsylvania, things like um, hex symbols are very, um, prevalent, they're a huge part of us growing up. These images of like these like giant welcome, there are all these things that kind of ward off like bad juju that the Amish use. Um, but I started to use these images um, as a way to talk about the heroin epidemic as well. So from a distance when you see this guy, right away when you see this welcome, which means welcome uh, in Pennsylvania Dutch, um, you don't notice what's going on, on the outside, but then all of a sudden you realize, um, and that there's this terrible thing that's happening inside of this message. And what's powerful about this and why I think it's important as designers um, for you to think about this is this is a way for me to be able to trick my audience into getting closer to something that they're not comfortable being close to. Um, so they see something that automatically pulls them in, the color right away pulls them in, they know that color, they know the image, um, but it was a way for me to get them closer. Um, uh, and that's, and that's kind of, I think, what's most important with social activism work or design activism or whatever you want to call it is it's not about alienating groups. It's about trying to lessen the distance between people. And as designers, that's what you need to do. You need to pull these people that are ingrained in the way they feel about things, and you need to soften that by using imagery and ideas that they can relate to. And if you can have them relate to it, you can get them to ask a question. And then that questioning can then morph into all sorts of other things and, 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 and different ways of thinking that they wouldn't have done before. So you need to use these kind of visual tricks to be able to pull them closer um, so that we can have conversations. And hopefully when we get close enough, we realize that we're not as different as we thought we were, and then we might be able to talk. And when that happens, um, you'll have the, the, the faction of people that are always gonna be ignorant bastards that are never going to wanna do that. But I will tell you, the majority of people will. They're just waiting to be pulled in in the right way. So again, the stories were what's most important too. When you make work like this, it, has, it can't be Wikipedia type um, uh, research. It has to be based on true stories because the fact of the matter is statistics and facts don't fucking mean anything if you don't have a story that backs them up, right? Now this isn't specifically about statistics, but this is definitely a story. So I saw a police officer, there's a street cop in my town that I know well, and he was doing tickets um, in our local parking lot near my studio. And I was asking him kind of like, what's going on? What's happening with the heroin epidemic? Are you guys finding out where the drugs are coming from? And he was just like, we're not allowed to do anything because they have a drug task force that dictates what they can do and what they can't do. And that's two people for a city of 20,000. So how much do you fucking think they're doing? Like nothing. So anyway, so he was telling me that a week before he was doing, he was giving tickets on our main street in our town and he saw uh, some, something sketchy going on like a block down and he went down and he ended up busting a dealer on the street that was selling heroin. So he took him in, um, it was a righteous bust. Um, he did what he was supposed to do. Um, at the end of the day, the chief of police called him in and formally reprimanded him and wrote him up because his job was meters that day, not arresting drug dealers. So it was more important for them to give that $10 ticket on the street than to save somebody's life. So that tells you, and, and, and if you look at most police departments, they're not really here for safety. They're revenue builders. I mean, and I'm not, and I'm not, dis, I'm not dissing the, the, the police department because I think there's a lot of great police officers out there. But the fact of the matter is, they're out there to make revenue to be able to pay their salaries in a lot of ways. And I'm not, I'm not putting them down for that, but it's very, very true. So that story on the surface, when I'm like, oh my God, talk about the apathy. It's so fucking terrible. But then when I did 
more research, I found out that they need to give those tickets so they can build the revenue to do this, that, and the other. And, and then after the fact, they end up letting people die. Because um, again, it's more important for the cop to follow the street sweeper and give a ticket um, behind them than it is to get keep people safe, which is really what they're, they're, they're in a perfect world supposed to be doing. So another one of my another one of my um, influences, which I think is important, uh, he doesn't get talked about in design history very often, and it's a massive shame because typographically he's I think he's groundbreaking in a lot of ways. Does anybody know who this is? Can anybody yell that out? Workman. Workman, yeah, exactly. So H. N. Workman. So um, he often one thing when you do some reading about it, if you decide to, he gets um, misconstrued as a Dadaist, which is not true. Um, at all, that's not he didn't. That's not the work that he does. He didn't kind of work under that same ideology. Um, he was uh, he was he was kind of a down and out guy, very much like me. Like bounced around from job to job, did commercial print jobs to be able to pay his uh, his way. Um, was terrible at business, so he lost a lot of his businesses along the way. Um, and then, but he was doing this like really groundbreaking things called like hot printing, um, where he was just like letter, he was inking letterpress type and then turning it upside down and just like putting it in places. So instead of locking it up, he was just like kind of placing it and then running uh, or bringing a clamshell press that on top of it um, to make these prints. So he was doing this really avant-garde stuff, but then during um, Holland's occupation by the Nazis, he started printing these little books, like this one down here, I have this one in my personal collection, it's like one of my prized possessions, um, that he would print and they would, uh, through the underground, distribute them in Holland um, to kind of, so it was like they were filled with poetry and all these things about um, what, it, what it means to be in an occupied territory um, during wartime. Um, so they're just beautiful little, just saddle stitch booklets um, that he would print um, with whatever type that they could, they could gather. Because during this time, all that lead type was gathered up to be able to make munitions um, for the war effort. So, it was, so lead type was really hard to come by um, during this time. So whatever they could scrap together, they would make it. And then he did these amazingly beautiful like wood type lockups that are just gorgeous. Um, but that he used this, oh, there I go. I'm talking like a designer again instead of telling you the social importance. Oh, look at the type. It's so beautiful. <laughs> he didn't give a fuck about that. It was about getting things out to people and raising spirits um, and keeping people um, in, in, a, in a place where they could make it through this. And, and he didn't make it through it. He was, um, he was captured by the Nazis and executed for the work that he was making. Um, so again, um, I don't think I'm going to be executed by my local police department, but it's the same fucking thing that's happening. Um, they didn't want his message to get out there because it was dangerous. This graphic design, this, it was dangerous. Um, and, and that's, oh man, it's power. Um, and, it's, and you guys need to think about your work that way. We don't have to just think about it as um, feeding um, the marketplace. It's power in a major way. So you have a responsibility to think about the form that you put to content as designers, wherever you work, even if you're a, a production designer, um, I, I think I implore you to think about what it is that you're making, what form or what content that you're putting form to, because your form is going to manipulate and it's going to encourage people to do something. So make sure that it's something that you feel good about before you decide to do that. So another one of my posters. I represent the police as pigs a lot. They really hate that, so I don't recommend it, but I, I think it's funny. So also part of my research, I started to do kind of my own detective work, so I you know, was able to find out that the night that my brother died, I had, uh, for, like I said, I had no idea he was even using heroin, but I was able to track down where the heroin that he bought came from, which is this little shithole bar um, in our city. Um, so I was doing these like really loose, fast, just like I was also like these types of things, I just had like tons of roll of paper and I was just scrawling them out at night and then ripping them off and throwing them aside and making them and ripping them off. Um, and then I would scan them at times and then put them on top of photographs or, or whatever. Super raw, super fast, not thinking about it besides the fact that I needed to get this shit out of my head. So I started to also go to all the dope spots in my city and photograph them. Um, right now, if you want to go to my city, this is 229 North 8th Street. You could buy a bag right now if you want to go. So if you're so inclined, this is happening right now. The police know it's happening right now, and it just sits there and does the same thing day in and day out. 
I started going to places in my city where heroin had killed people. So often bathrooms are the place. If you've noticed in a lot of places, bathrooms are being locked more. This is why. Um, because they, people, this is the number one place to find people that have overdosed and died because they're nice private spots where people aren't messed with. Um, so this is the local uh, McDonald's in my town where multiple people have died in that exact spot um, that I'm photographing. So I started to document that as well. Um, so, so my work, so what do you do if your work keeps getting destroyed? Like my work keeps going up and now it's building buzz, but I also want people to be able to see the things that I'm doing. So how do I get around the fact that the police are destroying my work? So the idea was like, well, what if I project images on walls? What if I get a projector, excuse me, and I start to um, put this stuff out in light? Then it's like, what if the police come and they block the light? Now we have this like philosophical thing of them stopping the light and I'm like, oh shit, this is gonna be great. Um, but I had, no, I had no money for a projector at this time. So what I started to do is I started to make artwork that would become projections even before I could even think about getting like a $10,000 or whatever projector to be able to do this work. I started making the work anyways, which is another thing that I would, I would say it's important for you guys to do. Don't be discouraged by the fact that you can't necessarily physically make something. Make it anyways, and, and you'll find a way to be able to materialize it um, somehow. Right, so I started playing around with stop motion um, animation. So I got some students at Westchester University in Pennsylvania to um, to be act. It was some of their acting students, and I got a makeup artist that kind of changed their face from you know kind of shooting up to nodding off to overdosing and dying and showing kind of the worst of it. So one of the terrible things that happens to people when they're found from overdose, it happens to anybody that dies and is not found for a certain amount of time. So any place that someone is laying down, the weight, the blood pools in those areas because it's no longer being kind of pumped through the body. So that you have this terrible, like um, awful purples and pinks and all, the worst colors you can possibly see on someone. Um, and that's what my brother looked like when, when I turned him over. So I, I was, and you can see that in that, that DOA piece that I showed, I kind of play around with that, that pattern on things. Um, but I wanted to, I wanted to put this out there, um, in a way. So I, I shot this stop motion and this was one of the first times too, that somebody came and I was really touched by the work. I felt like I was doing the right thing. I was at Westchester doing this and this kid showed up, um, that found out that I was going to be on campus doing this. And he told me that he's seen my posters, he really is inspired by the work that I'm doing, and, I, and the message is right on point, and that he struggles with pills himself, um, and he's starting to write music to be able to deal with that. And he wrote this song that he, he like spit for us like right on the spot, and it was amazing. Um, and he told me that, like I said, the week that he made that, he didn't feel compelled to be fucked up because he was so like hyped that he, he wrote this song. So um, I was like, so, so he spit this for us on the moment and then like I hooked him up with someone that I knew in Philadelphia and they did like a rough cut of his song. So I'm gonna play that for you guys through all the way because I wanna honor him doing that. His name's Riley, amazing artist, um, super honest in his work. Um, but I, so playing behind the stop motion, I'll show you this, I wanna play this song for you because it's, like I said, it's, it's amazing. In the middle of humanity, surrounded by bodies, who are filled with ideas, interests, and some hobbies. Some of them productive, some of them don't give a fuck, some of them are stuck. Dying just to live enough, I swear that I don't live enough. My dry, my ideas can be the lubricant, loop confused with substances, abusers, cruel and stupid shit, troublesome and dumb, stumbling through thoughts, mumble through my monologues of liquor that I bought, you know I bought a lot, and I know I ought to stop, but sweet escape to me, tastes like butter, smoking snaps, feel I need it to exist, to get ruthless in the booth and shit, the entire crew is lit, drink box wine off a crucifix, it's not cool, but who's new to this, foolish chick with daddy issues, turn her to a nudist, quick I'm Lucifer. I'm losing it, not proud of it I was happy then it sucked I was done after she sucked Smack the buzz and say good luck It left me feeling sad Disappointed mad Like the orgasm I had Should've morphed me to a man Rap orphans call me Stan Cause M should be my dad Mrs. Hill should be my mama Eat they lyrics, spit out commas Digesting their ideas Until I'm shitting them out Proper drove a phantom To the opera Hopped out fast in the tux With a mask in their ass While this ass be acting up I laugh, it's not enough Hand grass, don't my nuts 
hungry for competitors Words are dropping jigsaws and I'm clever when I settle them Arrange them then I let them run across the page and on the beat It's medicine for devil sons, they all screaming out let us be Hating Satan, rest in peace, I free them all eventually They father's been expecting me to drop the knees while he redeathing me But I already see his secret recipe for misery is really ecstasy Like happiness is close, but this bottle is still next to me Followed by the hollow, the hardest pill to swallow Is the idea that I don't have to go pop pills tomorrow That's what happens when the pot is on your right side Angel in the left ear You decide cause temptation live right here Addiction is a bitch as I sit and reminisce On some shit I felt I had to do But really what it is, is simply just a kid Who slipped in any trip down the rabbit hole a bit Climbed out, couldn't get a grip on what realness really is So we turn back to any hit His reality is shit and his loved ones never did Go extend the hand towards his So the sauce is where he lives And the options that life gives is to quit or to sit In a coffin or a crib Decide decisions quick Cause momentum is a bitch As I offer up my sins And I'm honest when I spit Tug of war between life or death I feel I'm getting split Yo ambition where you is Throw several sets of fists Aimed at devil's advocates Passionate and accurate I'm crying when I hit And I die a little bit Every time that I get lit Remind yourself that right Is really rhyming what he live Yo these substances Make you lose all of your substance These substances Make you lose all of your substance Don't come to me smiling But judging with assumptions Unless you really fuck with me Your opinion means nothing These substances Make you lose all of your substance These substances Make you lose all of your substance Don't come to me smiling But judging with assumptions Unless you really fuck with me Your opinion means nothing Take all these thoughts seriously I really hope you're hearing me And can decipher between all the love and lust and fear in me See I explain it easily When beers and beats are near to me But even if you're dear to me We'll meet and I will never speak Currently a person with some certain insecurities Masked by lots of laughter Acting out so I don't worry thee Personally I believe the world could do much worse than me I've seen it done to others to my brothers with such urgency life is such a mystery clouded by its history a woman with virginity still made the holy trinity wine and liquor mirror me i see it in the symmetry drinking reddit masses as spiritual as spirits be inside my own mind i shine and let the cross touch my soul i don't mind i know it's all my fault but if jesus died for his sins and not ours we'd be all fucked i let that sink in while i go and tear the bars of these substances make you lose all of your substance these substances make you lose all of your substance don't come to me smiling but judging with assumptions unless you really fuck with me your opinion means nothing these substances make you lose all of your substance these substances make you lose all of your substance don't come to me smiling but judging with assumptions unless you ever love for me your opinion means nothing some say everyone's like they got i don't know so i can't say the same but i'll be goddamn if i ever take his name in vain So, I mean, one of the reasons why I share that whole song is because Riley is doing in that, in that writing and what he did there is he's doing what an artist is here to do, what a designer is here to do, whatever that, you know, we're not going to even differentiate artist and designer, we're all, we all do the same fucking thing. But what he's doing is he is documenting what it means to be alive in his time and putting it out there in a way that hopefully at some point someone excavates that and they figure out that we didn't know what the fuck we were doing and they do something different with that. So we need to truthfully document our experience and not force it. We don't have to try to tell someone else's story. We all have a story to tell and that story is massively important in the history of what we're doing. So feel empowered to tell your story because we all have something really, really important um, to offer in kind of like the canon of history, right? So I had no money to make projections. So what I did is I got every free slide projector I could possibly get. Nobody wants them. Every art department had like 30 of them with dust on them. Um, so I started to collect these slide projectors and make big installation uh, installations out of these slide projectors and what I did is I started the GoFundMe during that time too to kind of empower my community not to just give me money because I could have afforded to probably figure out a way to pay for this myself I started the GoFundMe because I wanted to I wanted to engage my community um, so that 
Not everyone can stand on the street with a bullhorn, but if, we, if you can give a dollar or two dollars or five dollars, you've now become a part of this solution. You've become part of the process of trying to find a better way, um, and you're an accomplice now also um, in a really beautiful way. So within like a month of me putting this work out there, um, I was able to raise about $5,000. So this initial work that I was doing in the gallery, the gallery space was not the right place for this at all. I mean, the gallery is already set up to be, um, to, it, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's an environment of exclusion, not inclusion. Um, so the, I used the gallery space again. I used it purposely to be able to um, raise some money, but in the end, like the people that gave me the money were the people that loved me, my friends and things like that. So it was really kind of a beautiful thing. Um, so now I was able to purchase this projector. Um, so this, oh, this is another um, image from the installation. Oh, this, I, I, one thing I want to say about this too is that you guys need to be aware of what is available at your fingertips and how easily we can ignore the things that are at our fingertips. Both of these images came off of Google Images, and I specifically use them because they're there, but we ignore them. Because as Americans specifically, we have the luxury to be like, I'm not even gonna think about that. I'm not gonna look at that, I can't. It's just too much. And that's a massive privilege that we have. So I started pulling these images off to be able to use them for what I was doing, but also to honor the fact that we need to recognize the fact that these things are out there. Um, and we need to fucking use them to do something. Um, they're not background image. And often, like our society, we see something like this online and we're just on to the next thing right away. It was jarring to me to uh, follow people after my brother died. So on Facebook, when someone passes away, you get this rash of really heartfelt things that are sent to you. And some of them are beautiful, and some of them are sincere, and some of them are bullshit. But if you follow any one of those people two seconds after they wrote this heartfelt page, they're liking the next cat video, or they're watching the Samsung thing, or they're liking the someone getting kicked in the nuts or hit with a wiffle ball. So there are, you're in this place of honoring someone, and you can't even slow yourself down enough to spend time with that before you're on to something else. Um, and that's another beautiful thing that art and design has the power to do. It has the power to slow time down um, in a really beautiful way. Um, so you need to use it to do that. And I implore you, like, uh, Google Images also, like one of the things I was doing during this time is I was trying to find a way to separate this work because it was starting to like kind of fuck me up a little bit. So I started to like shoot, I have this huge collection of my brother-in-law's vintage action figures. So I was shooting all these like images of them as a way to kind of like lessen this work. And that ended up turning into a book about Syrian children in the end. So, so now that I'm doing this, it ended up being way more depressing than anything else I was doing. Uh, because now that I'm doing work in this vein, I don't think I can do anything else. Because um, the concept for me of form for the sake of form seems so foreign um, in any way. Um, it just, it, I can't do that anymore. So part of the, this also is I had this like, I had this like, again, like this is like Heather, Heather and I love these things. Um, using Google Street View and Google Earth for things, but I was like, I spent my, I found myself after my brother died going into Google Street View and just walking through my town um, on Google Street View. And, and what is kind of amazing about it is if you ever noticed, whenever the car comes through, it's all shot at different times. So you can be in 2012 and then all of a sudden you turn the corner and now you're in 2017 and you're back. So I found myself being able to be in places where my brother was alive and then places that he was gone. And it was something that really um, was just, it was, it was kind of a crazy discovery and something that was, and I found myself trying to go around my city and find where his car was parked so I'd know where he was at when these things were happening. Um, so anyway, so I had this, this Google Street View image going and the projectors were set up so when people looked at it and they walked up on it, they were kind of in the city also. Um, and I'd like to take credit for that. That was a total happy accident. I set it up and all of a sudden I was taking images and I'm like, no, wait a minute, like I'm walking. And then I totally owned that shit. So that's another, that's another piece of advice that I'm gonna give the designers or artists or anybody in here. You can fake it until you make it. And, and that's totally fine. And again, you can derive meaning after the fact. I was meant to find that. I did that work and I found it in the process of just staying in front of it. And now I own it as something that I made and put in there because there was a reason why I was there and I found that. 
So I've connected like amazingly through from people. So I did this talk in Burlington, Vermont. Someone told this guy here in the green shirt, his name is Chiro. He's an artist um, from Vermont, but he goes to school at Vancouver Island University in Vancouver. Um, he struggled with addiction. He had found his roommate dead from an overdose. He was making pottery about his experience. I mean, we became friends through the internet just because his sister who was in Burlington told him in Vancouver that I was doing this work and we connected and we became really close friends. And then he drove down from Vermont just to see my talk that I gave here. And now we're collaborating on work together. So again, that is what it's about. I want, to, we all need to be collaborating on these things use our skill set where we can don't hoard things um, and share the process because when we do things together we make beautiful work when we hoard it um, it loses it loses its meaning oh so this is a quick video of the installation so I was also playing around with reel-to-reel uh, -reel projectors too and like looping audio and things So that was something I did with this work too, like and I, I do with my projections, is all the things that were said to my family, I put them out there in, in huge 30 foot letters on the sides of buildings. And the, and the chief of police actually called me at some point and he told me that they don't appreciate me putting the words of public officials on the walls in our city. And I was like, tough shit. I was like, if you don't like what they're saying, then tell them not to say those things. Um, again, it's because they don't want this like day-to-day -day message they're, 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 they're spewing out to get out there because it's the same things they do every day. It's just no one's calling them on that shit and holding them accountable. And in small cities, in places like Chicago, much harder, but in small cities, local government is massively malleable. So you can, um, they're really afraid of losing their jobs. So you put the pressure on, you can really get things done in smaller cities. So, so I got this projector. You can see my super, super high-tech setup here. It's a, it's a $15,000 projector sitting on a coffee table that usually sits on my front porch with a, with a random two by four that I found in the street that's holding it up, and this is what I'm using. So the projector, again, I bought with the GoFundMe money. And what I find um, really great about me getting the projector that way is it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to all of those people that gave me that money. Um, so I'm representing them when I go out as well, and that holds me accountable in a really, really great way. Um, to keep pushing and to keep going because this, this work belongs to them. So this was the first test that I did um, uh, in my town. It was in this really sketchy part of my town and I was doing this just as a test and I was like kind of in this, town, in this, in this alley like by myself and this like kind of rough looking character was coming down the alley and I was like, oh fuck, he's gonna fuck with me. Um, and he, uh, he came and he stopped and he looked at what I was doing. He pulled his phone out and was taking pictures and he came over to me and I was like, oh fuck. And he like just put his hand out and gave me a pound and was like, this, you're doing the right fucking thing. He's like, thank you for doing this. And right then I was like, this, this, is, gonna, this is gonna really be powerful. Uh, this is gonna really work. Um, and it gave me like the, uh, the power to go out and do it. Because this was also an anxious thing. As designers, we rarely get the chance to be able to stand in front of our work in the moment that it's being made and be able to talk to people about it. We never get that luxury. Um, and it's fucking scary, um, but it's also really super amazing. Um, and it's empowered me to want to come and work with students and talk to you guys and share these things um, because those conversations that happen um, are really special and really powerful. So a lot of my early work, and it's still ongoing, is, is, is challenging my local coroner because he was just awful to my family um, through the process of us um, losing my brother. Um, so I'm, ask, I, I'm, I'm imploring them to think about the idea that we need to start making overdose death a homicide. Because you have to understand, like, what is being put in bags of heroin right now, they know that you're gonna, fentanyl is like 100 times more powerful than heroin. So, I mean, some of us, like, if it was, if it was on this podium and I touched it, it could absorb my skin and I could overdose. Um, it's crazy powerful. And the problem is they're mixing it in with really low-grade heroin to try to up the uh, qual or the, the effect. But the problem is it's not homogenous. So you might end up having all fentanyl at the top and some heroin at the bottom, and then somebody you know, shoots up half that bag that they've used 100 times before, and it was fine, but now they're shooting pure fentanyl. 
or in some cases now carfentanil, which started in, you know, in, in Ohio and now is just about everywhere. That's an elephant tranquilizer um, that literally a flake of it on something, a surface, if you touched it, we could overdose and die. We had a little kid in Michigan um, about six months ago that was at his, not six months ago, yeah, maybe a year ago, was at his local pool and he was changing in the change room and he just must have touched a surface where someone was using it and he died of an overdose. Um, that first responders had to wear gloves and all sorts of things because they can overdose on the scene when they're trying to save people because it's so strong. So I bring this up because that's a premeditated act of putting that shit in the heroin. So it's really, it's premeditated murder as far as, as, far as I'm concerned. That's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna push um, for that. Um, and and the, the, the tough thing with this conversation is too, a large percentage of people that are selling are those that are supporting their habits. Um, so you have to con consider that, but there's also a huge amount of people that are selling purely for capitalist gain. And those are the ones that we need to do something about. Um, because they're, like I said, they're selling death in every glassine bag that they fill and they sling and they don't give a shit. Um, it's all about making that money when they can and, and not giving a shit about the body count that happens after that. Chicago is hit massively hard um, right now and it's not talked about nearly as much as it should be, um, especially in, in communities of color. Uh, in Baltimore, this has been going on for the last 30 years and no one's really gave a shit about that. That's a, that's a, that's a part of this narrative that's not discussed um, at all and, and needs to be part of this discussion and on the table, um, how kind of... Um, this is looked as kind of a suburban problem right now um, because it's getting attention and that causes outrage because neighborhoods of color that have been dealing with this for years and years and years didn't get any attention around this and that is absolutely true. But the fact of the matter is now that we're getting attention around this subject, we need to do something about all areas. Neighborhoods, every neighborhood of color, every suburban area, this is not, again, it's not socioeconomic, it doesn't live across the tracks, it breathes on our doorsteps and we have this opportunity now because we're talking about it and people are engaged to really do something. So these projections, like I said, in a city like Lebanon also, which is a small city, like in Chicago, like last night we did, we did some in Chicago last night, which I was super proud of the, of the work that we did, but people, like we saw cops ride by, by on a bike and they didn't even look up. I was like, oh, they're just like doing something. Um, but, in, but in Lebanon, um, this is like, it, it's, it's, it's a medium that is just not, it, it's not utilized, never been utilized in a place like this. So it's, it, it has a power to it. So this was the, one of the first ones that I did. It's that same video that I showed you, but I started to add some typography to it to kind of walk people to the well a little bit more as to what I was doing. And this is the funeral home in my city where the majority of the um, overdose victims are laid out. My brother's service was here um, as well. So this was, this was the one that it started to get a little bit dicey. I, I did this projection on a block in my city where a lot of the heroin trade happens. So it was this image, um, and the arm there is um, an Eric Avery image. He's a printmaker, I'm gonna talk about him in a minute here. Um, but that's his image, and then I put the needle in there. But the image said heroin is sold on this block. So it was calling it out kind of in like 30 foot letters. Um, not so much for the dealers on the street, but it was more for the people that kind of just walk through these neighborhoods and know that this is happening, but shield their eyes from it. Like, yeah, again, it's just like on the internet, I don't wanna deal with it. Like I know it's there, but I have privilege enough that I don't have to deal with it. I mean, we have to look at this thing and deal with it. Um, so. so what was really interesting about this is this was kind of like my cop out to this first original idea. What I wanted to do was project on actual dope houses and have heroin is sold here. Um, but my family lives in this city. It's a small city, and you can only mess with somebody's money long and for so long before um, something happens. So I kind of, I softened it a little bit, but what happened, which was beautiful, is that I started projecting um, this heroin sold in this block, and a couple days later on Facebook, these anonymous pages started popping up of um, people that were actually calling out the areas, like heroin is sold here, and kind of like a, like a, like a pseudo, uh, style that I was already doing. So it was really kind of a beautiful thing. The community started to take ownership for this project. So again, there's my high-tech coffee table that holds my projector. And I use a gas generator. That's how I power it. How am I doing time-wise? Are we good? I'm going over? I'm fine? Okay, good. So again, I was doing some things like, these aren't videos, but like that Google Street View was kind of walking behind this typography. So it did a kind of cool thing on the buildings um, with the typography. 
And again, this is again with like these like serendipity moments that happen. Like this is um, a projection I did. We were, we were shooting in this truck that had a cap on. It was pouring down rain and the rain stopped and we had this huge puddle on the ground and it like reflected this image. Um, and it, you know, it looks like a professional soundstage. Like I didn't intentionally pick this spot because the lights like flanked the image perfectly and this thing, but we ended up getting this image that now um, is just this super powerful image um, that the majority of it just happened because I was there. And that's something really great about a projector and why I think projection work is so powerful is that imagine now that every surface is a surface as a designer that you can fill up with space. Your city becomes a book that you can fill up that is just a beautiful idea. Um, and it, what's one of the reasons why it makes us so powerful. So another person that, I, another name I wanna leave you guys with is Sue Ko, if you don't know her. She's a political printmaker, painter, artist, just general badass in, in every sense of the word. Um, and she really epitomizes the idea of the graphic witness. Um, so she places herself in a position of not being able to change things, but she documents them. So she goes into slaughterhouses and draws in the slaughterhouse. She's a vegan. Um, and this, this print here is a lithograph that she did of her as a child. She grew up next to a slaughterhouse um, and had to like grow up listening to animals screaming. Um, so now she like breaks into slaughterhouses and draws and then makes prints out of them. Um, and the work is, again, it's, it's, it's just unfiltered witnessing um, of, of her experience and the work is so powerful. Um, so this leads me to the, the project that I'm working on now. So I started to collect activist art as part of my thesis um, for my, for my uh, master's degree and I started collecting work from people that I admired. Um, so like Sue Ko was one of them um, and a couple of others. Um, and I had their work on loan for my thesis and I started to get this work all together. I was like, I don't wanna give any of this stuff back. It is, um, it's, uh, it's too, uh, there's just, it's, it's too important. So I reached out to them and asked them if they would, they would donate this work to me to start a, a nonprofit um, traveling museum of this work that I'll build over time. Um, and they, a lot of them were just like, Suko which like, gave me like $4,000 worth of their work. She's like, just have it. Go to my website, anything you want, you can have it. Um, so it's getting a lot of support and it's um, something that I'm hoping to travel to colleges and universities so that we can have larger discussions on all sorts of social issues um, with the idea that schools that take this have to build curriculum around it. They can't have it as just background imagery for the school. It has to have a uh, higher meaning than that. All right, so I'm getting the wrap up, the Q&A, but I wanna show you, um, just I wanna share, so this is Eric Avery. This is another artist that um, I, I have worked with and he's a super influence. He got his start as a doctor um, working in the death camps of Somalia. This is an image of him in 1981. Um, feeding, uh, he was in, a, in a, a camp of starving refugees. Um, and, and what he did as a way to cope with this, which is very similar to my story, is he built a small little print shop in a tent in, the, in, this, in this camp and started making woodblock prints about his experience to be able to cope and to talk about it. He also works around human rights and uh, he's, he's gay and he does a lot of work, he did a lot of work around the AIDS epidemic when it was first happening. And, he was, and what he did is start documenting his experience as being a gay man during this time. So this print on the right hand side of the screen, in my opinion, is the most powerful piece of artwork that's ever been made. He made this right before, well, he got his first AIDS test and he was told that you're going to be positive. This was in 1984. You need to prepare yourself for this being positive. So he went home and at that point it was an absolute death sentence. So he went home and he got this huge piece of gnarly wood and just started carving his arm out of this block, right? And he made this print of his arm during his blood test. It says everything about this time in history in a totally, uh, truthful and raw way and is a document now for us to have um, after the facts. It's really funny, like I was, I was interviewing him for my book that I was working on and I was telling him this story about how much it meant to me and did you think about this and it's so culturally relevant and, uh, and he was just like, after all this stuff I was waiting for this amazing answer and he was just like, yeah, I really didn't think about any of that stuff. <laughs> so I was like, oh man, like I really was, but it was, he was semi-joking. But anyways, like this is a, a document of a specific time in history made by a person talking about their experience and it's so powerful and now it's here for us um, forever. So it gets me to what I'm doing now and why I'm here. So I got a chance to spend the, 
uh, time with amazing students here at DePaul, talking about my story, engaging them, talking about their work, helping them crit. It was just, it's just been amazing. And then we went onto the street last night after our workshop and started projecting your messages on the street. So this one here, um, I didn't realize until I came and I started talking that the pipes on the south side of Chicago are starting to rot away and people are getting poisoned um, by the water on the south side. Um, that needs to be talked about. So we talked about it last night and there were people stopping and looking um, and taking photographs. So we just started a ripple about that conversation last night by this one simple message put on this wall. That is power. Segregation is the new segregation. So we're talking, um, I, I can't remember specifically, I'll paraphrase it terribly, but he was talking kind of about how African American families, in a lot of cases, don't want other races integrating with African American families um, through dating or through having children, and that bothers him. He saw um, uh, us. Uh, Thera, the actress Theron, like the, when she, she adopted an African-American baby and there was all sorts of really bad backlash from um, the black community saying like, how dare you, this is not your experience to give them. So it really affected him. So this is something he wanted to talk about. So he put this message out, segregation is the new segregation. And there was somebody walking down the street that saw this last night and stopped and came over to him and was like, I know exactly what you're saying. I'm so glad you're saying this. And he walked away. It just, everything just happened in that moment. It was like, what he wanted to do happened. He sent somebody away with what he wanted to say, and now they can carry that on, and you have no idea how far that will go. Beautiful moment. It was, I mean, I get choked up a little bit thinking about it. It was such a beautiful thing last night. And I know you want me to wrap up, but I'm not going to do it. So this was another one um, about kind of our focus on our devices and how we're in our phones and we live there and all of these fucked up things are happening around us. And she made this piece um, that's just beautiful. It's simple and beautiful and graphically bold and it just, it says what she wanted to say and she said it last night in a really, really bold way. This is me breaking down beats on the street. So I'm gonna leave you guys, um, I wish I had something really, really perfect to end this with other than I want you guys to not be afraid to step in front of your work and see what happens. Um, as designers, we don't have that chance. And I decided to do that and share my experience. And I feel, I truly believe that art and design has the ability to save lives. You have that power. You have the power to start conversations. You have the power to get the police to try to censor you. You have this amazing power um, that you can, you can put out there. And I encourage um, all of you to do that. And I, I want to thank you so much for having me here. Um, and uh, that's all I got for you. Does anybody have any questions for me? Yes. Oh, oh, is there a mic? Yeah. Do you, uh, I, I, yeah you want to, I, can, I can hear her, but if you want to give it to somebody in the back, that's fine. Go ahead. Okay. Um, was like the water tower place just because I knew there'd be like a ton of people walking by there mm -hmm. and I was just curious like do you have any places that are kind of on your bucket list of like places that you want oh, places to, to project oh, I, mm -hmm. I haven't really made that I know what you're saying I think there's places that would be really cool I like the spontaneous nature of it you know that's the one because my projectors on my truck I can just kind of drive around and find places um, yeah I don't know what's on my bucket list I would have loved to project something on Trump Tower last night um, uh, but there's, there's some other groups doing that, which is really great. You know, like I, I shared a piece with my, my workshop last night of, you know, this image of just this giant block letter and it says pay bribes here with a giant arrow, like little simple messages like that, that are super powerful. Um, yeah. So I don't, I don't know if I have a bucket, I'll, I'll, we'll stay in touch and I'll let you know. Um, maybe you guys need to find places for me to do it. And I'd love to come back and we'll, we're like really bomb the city. So anybody else? That's it? Somebody asked something. You may come up to after. So All right, yeah. So I, again, I really, really appreciate you guys being here and looking at my work and considering it. 
Um, and, and like I said, if you walk away with a question um, after tonight, I think that's what's important. Because as designers, we're bombarded with this idea that all of our work has to be a call to action. Um, and that's just not the case. I mean, no single poster that we make is gonna end the AIDS epidemic. But what our work can be is a call to question. And that's what I encourage you guys to do. If you, if you can get someone to ask one question for what you've done, you are massively successful in your work. So again, thank you guys absolutely so much for being here. Oh, we're gonna raffle now. Sorry, I know this has gone a little bit long and it's getting close to finals and I'm happy that you are all here because I know a lot of people just said, Oh, I went Professor way over, Quinn, I'm sorry guys. I'm so tired, I have so much to do. Um, so you know, we're also gonna try to um, video, video these all next year so you can live stream them you know, from home too. But, so Adam does have, how many prints? I have four prints. Four prints um, that we will raffle off and because they didn't arrive, they were supposed to come Wednesday, they're gonna come uh, probably Monday. So if anyone is not at DePaul, if you're from the outside, I'll ship them to you. Um, otherwise, I'll just give them to can you. Can somebody bring the screen back up so I can show people what they're winning because we don't have it? Is that okay? Do you want, did they take it down? There it is. Okay. So okay. we'll raffle this guy off first. So you pull the number and you'll read it and then we'll see who has it, hopefully somebody. All right, so 725-0042. Oh, ah, all right. So you get you get this you get poster, okay. which I've never given this poster to anybody before. So it's my first time. sorry, we're going kind of fast because I know it's late. All right. We so have a dinner reservation. This guy I'm going to give away also. Is the, okay, so seven two five zero zero four one. Oh, all right. Are you DePaul? No. Oh, okay. So we'll get it to you. Get me your address. Okay. All right. What else? What else am I giving away? Um, this guy. Okay. So seven two five zero zero three eight. Anyone? I wonder if that was Nate. Okay. Right, they that lose. person's gone. They so. lose. Uh, seven two five zero zero three four. All right, we're striking out mm. here. <laughs> They're like yes. Seven two five zero zero three two. All right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, man. <laughs> All right, and what is the last one I have? Oh, I know which one it is. You know what's in the package? It's this guy. Okay. <laughs> and this, this is the one that got me in the most trouble, so you guys should. Uh, so 725-0036. Yeah, oh, all yes. right. Okay, so, so all of you know where I am, so you can find me Monday. But for the one person, if you could write your address down for me, or if you're, uh, I'll give you my info so you can come find it. Um, other than that, we have to wrap up. Thank you all so right, much thank for coming. All right, thank you guys. Feel free to come talk to Adam after, okay?